The All Blacks take on the Springboks in two crucial matches that will probably decide Ian Foster's future. I cover five key talking points right now. Let's roll that intro. Kia ora everyone, my name's Zach, I love rugby, welcome back to Hakka Time Rugby. I'm going to jump straight into it guys, so five key talking points in the upcoming series between the All Blacks and the Springboks. Talking point number one has been the criticism about both the All Blacks and the Springboks in recent performances. I'll start off with the All Blacks, obviously a lot made on the series loss to Ireland, and I think a lot of the major criticism, particularly from All Blacks fans, has been the nature in which the team has lost. You know, it's been a steady decline since 2019, but even as far as late last year to this year, there's been a further decline in this team. A lot of people have said that the All Blacks have stayed stagnant. I actually think that they've they've started to decline, mainly because they're a team that just doesn't understand their own style. There's a, obviously a communication breakdown between coach um, management and players, which I'll touch on in a bit in one of the other talking points. And, you know, there's a lot of work to do for the All Blacks to come back. I know they can do it, but I think all of the criticism right now around the All Blacks is probably warranted. Um, and let's talk about the Springboks. So the Springboks obviously challenged somewhat, or at least on paper, um, against Wales. And a lot of criticism has come towards them on their performance against Wales and the potential decline of that team. Um, I think that criticism is not warranted. And I'll tell you why. So game one obviously went really close. Springboks win that. But um, uh, Yanchis was selected there at uh, at 10. And obviously, they're used to Andre Pollard running that ship. So I think there is a real dependence on Andre Pollard for this team to perform well. And it obviously showed that there was a lack of continuity in the wider squad during that game and game management options there. Uh, so, that, But they were still able to win that game. And then going into the next game, uh, obviously, the selections were largely an untested squad that was really there from it for a development opportunity. And I think that's been quite brilliant from Nina Barr and, um, and Rassi Erasmus to blood new players, bring them in and see how they perform under pressure. And when he did in game three, obviously select what is a much more um, solid team, you saw the performance and it was quite a comfortable win. So ultimately, I don't see the criticism against the Springboks as fair. And I would say they are still right there at the top. Um, You know, others, I'll let others debate sort of where they sit in that pecking order, but certainly a team that can win the World Cup, certainly one of the best teams in the world right now. Talking point number two, the Springboks will dominate the set piece both scrum and line out. I think this talking point is largely due to the fact that there has been a decline somewhat in the set piece for the uh, for the All Blacks this year in particular. They were exposed by Ireland in some areas, particularly the line out in game three. And in patches, the scrum obviously didn't perform as well as it usually does. Um, there's also been a number of changes called in. So a few of the younger caps coming in, Tyrell Lomax, Ethan De Groot, who should have been there against um, uh, Ireland, and uh, Fletcher Newell as well coming in. So it's going to be interesting to see how the young guys perform. But, you know, the All Blacks are, are very much wounded um, and, and are looking to rebuild some confidence in the set piece and they get the toughest challenge in world rugby up against the spring box we know how effective they are in line out time we know how effective they are at scrum time and these new caps you know a lot of these younger guys for the all blacks will have their hands full they do have the inclusion of jason ryan coming in from the crusaders to help bolster you know some of the set piece work and the forwards in general so it'll be interesting the mark that he starts to leave on this team uh, we know how well the Crusaders perform traditionally as well at Super Rugby level. However, this is international level. So there's a lot of questions to be answered. And I'm going to be keeping a very close eye on the set piece. I do think we will see, you know, a lot more motivation and input and, and sort of push bef- from the All Blacks, namely because they are somewhat wounded. There's a lot of criticism coming against them. But they're up against the world champions who largely won the World Cup based on the set piece. So huge challenge. Huge area of focus, and um, I'm fascinated to see how that plays out. Talking point number three, the 20-minute red card rule has been applied for the uh, rugby championship. So we know that it has not been applied, obviously, by wider world rugby. It was adopted at super rugby level, and Sanzar countries have agreed to adopt it for the rugby championship. Um, How do I think that will impact the series? I don't think it does impact the series largely. I think if anything, you know, my my position is that I'm in favor largely of the 20 minute red card rule. I've got a podcast coming up with Rich from the Rugby Analyst where we're going to dive into some of the talking points around, you know, the cards that were applied during the mid-year tours and whether or not we're getting the right rugby product right now. I think the 20 minute red card rule does eliminate what we're seeing in terms of lazy or poor technique resulting in red cards. Obviously, there is no place for, you know, for real foul play, so for intent to harm players. 
But what we're seeing red cards being applied to is you know lazy technique or poor technique. And I don't think that's the right area to be affecting key games. Um, and therefore, I like the inclusion of the 20-minute um, rule for the rugby championship. I do hope it gets applied a bit wider than that, obviously, by World Rugby. That, that remains to be seen. Um, but it does give an opportunity for a bit more free-flowing nature of the game, and in particular for teams or games not to be ruined by an early red card. Talking point number four, the coaching merry-go-round, the management merry-go-round. Look, there's a lot of problems there at New Zealand Rugby Union, as well as you know the All Blacks in particular, the, uh, the coaching setup. So we know that there have been some changes um, recently made. So um, you know, two coaches out, in comes Jason Ryan as the, uh, the forwards coach. And then you've got Foster in Foster stepping to that attacking coach role, which, you know, I don't get a lot of confidence from that. You've got the CEO coming under criticism from Steve Hansen and the New Zealand Rugby Union board coming under criticism from Steve Hansen saying that they're really not being transparent, that they've lost the, the playing group. Um, it's a it's a mess. He did make one good point that Mark Robinson being included as well as Ian Foster as a new coach. At the same time, it's it's a lot of transition to be making at that point in time. Um, and really left the All Blacks somewhat vulnerable, I feel, as well. So fair point there. Uh, but make no mistake, Ian Foster is under an immense amount of pressure. I don't think the changes that they have made have gone far enough. And um, and I, I spoke about it in one of my reviews of the Game 3 against Ireland in that the All Blacks just look like a confused team trying to play more of a Northern Hemisphere kick-first type mentality, which is not in the DNA of the All Blacks. They flicked the switch in the second half and were able to you know, pile in a few more points into Ireland's credit. They were able to come back and shut out the All Blacks. But this looks like a team that is really struggling to find its feet. And the fact that a lot of these players have played together for a significant amount of time, it points more towards a coaching issue. Now, make no mistake, Ian Foster has two games to prove his worth, right? If not, Scott Robertson, Razor, has already come out putting a lot of pressure on New Zealand Rugby Union, basically indicating that they will lose him if they do not consider his application for All Blacks coach. And I think that is a complete masterstroke, despite what um, Goldie, Jeff Wilson says on the breakdown, talking about how that was unfair for him to put pressure on. He is, in my opinion now, the best man for the job, who is making his case for this role, and obviously understands how to manage you know, the public sentiment towards these types of issues. So he is putting pressure on Ian Foster. He is putting pressure on the New Zealand Rugby Union, and he should do exactly that. Now... That All of that is indicated that Ian Foster has two games to prove whether or not he can come out on top in South Africa and show these improvements that he keeps talking about. So let's see if that happens, and uh, we'll be keeping an eye on that one as well. And the last talking point I want to cover off, guys, is that this rivalry between the All Blacks and South Africa, which in my opinion is the greatest rivalry in rugby right now, always has been, and I believe will be for a long time to come, it is alive and well, right? Despite all the criticism of both teams, you know, the fans, the media, everyone's really excited for this tour. I certainly am. As I mentioned, there's a number of talking points that we've just gone through that will really be interesting and something that we'll monitor um, during this series, which is another historic series. I just really love that we're getting back to these old school type of tour type scenarios. And, um, and this is another one as well. So, you know, both fans have a huge, both groups of fans have a huge amount of respect for the other group. And I think to write off either team is really fool's errand. I mean, the All Blacks are under a lot of pressure, but they proved against Ireland, which is interesting to me. A lot of people are really putting the boot into the All Blacks, but the way I saw that Irish series is that Ireland are one of, if not the best team in the world, they're the most well-drilled team in the world, and the All Blacks have lost their way and need direction ASAP. They can definitely do that. And regardless of who they're playing with and regardless of who the coach is, they still have X-Factor players there, you know, who can open the game up and can take games away from teams, as we saw in that first test against Ireland in a 15-minute period before halftime. On the other side, I've been really impressed with Willemse coming in. And I think, um, you know, he's a pure X-Factor player as well. So the matchup between Willemse and, um, and Will Jordan is going to be so good to watch. The forward battle, which I covered already. The talking points, you know, the coaching battle between Foster, Ninabar, um, Erasmus and what they're trying to develop. All of that put together makes me really excited for this, um, for this series. And um, I think both sets of fans are in for a treat. So... I'll be building up this. Um, I have a couple of talking point discussions coming up with Rich from the Rugby Analyst. Um, I'll obviously be doing a quick preview once we hear the um, the team sheets 
as well as uh, post-match reviews in the upcoming um, games as well. So stick with me on Hucker Time Rugby, guys. If you like the video, please hit like and um, let me know what you think about the, those talking points as well as the series. I'll be back for another one soon. Take care.